Uh, before we go to questions, I just wanted to just offer a couple of quick questions. One, um, normally I think as, as, as Professor Sampat said, that the, the, the normally the role of the government's larger in the area of basic research, particularly uh, industry role usually gets bigger as the research is more applied and moving toward clinical trials. That's not always true. And in the case of COVID antibiotics and certain health risk, you see actually a fairly deep role by the government, uh, even in late stage clinical trials. So in the COVID context, I think that the general role is, 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 is doesn't really hold. Um, and sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes you see a bigger role for the government in the late stage in some of these uh, uh, exceptional health risk. Uh, uh, Another thing that I think is confusing to a lot of people, not the members of this panel, these panels are really expert on all of these things, but uh, the public sometimes doesn't understand that just because the government funded the technology in some parts of the research and development, it may or may not have legal rights in the patents, that the legal rights are conveyed in a very narrow and technical uh, basis of whether or not the funding was related to an invention. An invention may or may not be the most important part, even of the development process, given the way academics disclose research and, and the importance of clinical trial funding, for example, which is generally uh, often not patentable at all. Uh, that said, the government has various contractual ways that they could exercise rights when they fund research, like in the COVID case, when you give uh, 700 million or a billion dollars to a company to pay for the building of a factory or conducting clinical trials, you can certainly put into the contract all kinds of provisions, whether or not you have rights in the patent intervention. And that's something that uh, I think most of us have been disappointed has not happened. Uh, the NIH used to do more of that through the CRADE agreements. They used to have reasonable pricing clauses. And the CRADE is there was an independent right that they'd exercise outside of the patents, for example. Uh, now, I'm sorry for taking everyone's time up, but I'd like to ask the panelists, uh, uh, starting with Sampat, working backwards with Zane, Catherine, and Luis, if you'd like to pose questions to the other panelists. And I'd like you to pose the questions first. And then after the, uh, the four panelists pose the questions, I'd like to give all the panelists one shot to respond to the questions. And I'd like to start, if you don't mind, uh, bobbing with you, if you have a question. Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. Actually, I have, um, I have a bunch, but let me pick two. I have one for Luis and I have one for Catherine. Um, um, and maybe it's Catherine and Zane, actually, because it's, it's on the intersection of your presentations. Luis, you said that there's a lag, there's oftentimes a long lag between um, when the patent is granted and a certificate of correction. So the question is just why do they do it? Like what, what, what forces them to do it when they do do it? And the question for, for Zane and Catherine is a, maybe a clarifying question. So the purchase agreements that, that are going through that ATI. Um, so when I look at, um, on your tracker, Zane, when I look at, for example, a, a Moderna contract or another contract that has a procurement in it, um, you know, the government's also committing to buy 100 million doses. So it gets 100 million doses um, and an option of 300 million. Are those, are those separate from or the same as what's going through ATI? That's the question. Zane, you're, you're up. Uh, you're muted, Zane. My questions would be to uh, Catherine and Professor Sampat. Um, Catherine, it's 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 fascinating. The the ATI thing is really just it's so bizarre. Um, and I, I I I guess I I wanted to get a better sense of what the justification you think like really is for going this way, you know, like there's, there's kind of, there's a kind of nominal justification that they're providing you, but like, what do you think is really going on? Like why, why do we have this kind of weird intermediary that is, you know, playing a quasi governmental role and then also helping the government evade accountability. Um, so that's my question to you. And then to Professor Sampat, um, I think it's a, it's a pretty fascinating idea. Um, I think, um, I'd be curious to know what, um, I, I guess I'd be curious to know what has been done so far, kind of if, if the patent pairs have been studied empirically in a, in a different way than the one you have provided. Catherine. 
Um, so my question for Zane is if the U.S. government, and it does seem like you made a very compelling case, does in fact have rights in the um, Moderna vaccine candidate, on what terms do you think the government should license those rights to Moderna if Moderna would probably need a license? And for Professor Sampat, I was wondering, um, do you think that there will always be limitations to a kind of systematic, mechanical way of tracing patent rights in publicly funded inventions and how can they be overcome or does it need to be kind of organic research as well? Luis. Yeah, so to 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 Professor Professor San Pat, uh, so the question is <clears throat> um, would the patent pair uh, patent um, papers pair uh, have to have a perfect match in terms of of, of the um, the inventors and the authors. I I, I think there's kind of like an strategic uh, reason why some pat some authors are included in a patent or a paper, and so you will see papers that have more authors than the inventor's name in the patent. So is that is there a way? You can correct for that. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that training the database with the project reporter uh, uh, cases will help, but I'm, uh, I'm wondering your, your, your thoughts on that. And the other thing is, um, is there a way to include the SEC form disclosures in the, um, in the algorithm? Because that's, that's, that's a source that we really use a, a lot of time to find evidence of government funding. Um, so, in you know, it's, uh, the SEC, the SEC um, uh, website is quite uh, open data uh, oriented. So, so I think it will be um, interested, interesting to 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 include that, um, if possible. So, I'd, I'd like to, uh, in terms of the answers, I'd like to start with uh, Professor uh, Bob and Sampat, and then uh, work backwards through Zane, Catherine, and, and uh, Luis. So let's start with uh, Professor Sampat. Great, happy to do so. Um, so great questions. Um, I, I think I, can, I wrote them all down here. So Zane's question, how have, um, how have pairs been used before? Uh, the, the most common way, place in which they've been used is to answer a question that may be of interest to people here. The question of how do patents affect follow on innovation? Right. So, and so what people have done, and this is a, a technology, a, te technology, a technique developed by uh, Fiona Murray, who's at MIT now, but essentially to look at when a pat, like, so you have a pair now, uh, which is, you know, essentially the same thing. And, and she did so by hand. Um, uh, and then what happens to citations to the publication when a patent hits, essentially, do they, do, are they effective? And I think they, she, together with Scott Schlern, find a six to 10% decrease or something, but it's research like that. That's the kind of empirical economics research it's been used for. But I'll also comment uh, on Luisa's question about inventor overlap, because she took, uh, she took the technique from, I believe, a sociologist of science named Philippe de Coeur, uh, who, who was precisely interested in the difference between the norms of inventorship and the norms of co-authorship. Um, and yeah, so papers often have many more authors than, than patents do. Um, and I think that does complicate the world a little bit. It's in some sense an empirical question, as you say, like you can, um, you can find the right level of overlap that you, that you need, but I think uh, uh, empirically, and, and you, you have training sets that, through which you could do so, but I agree that it's imperfect for that reason. And then let me let me turn to um, to, to Catherine's question because it's related and it's this has to do a little with, you know, the question of whether you can just in general, like whether whether robots will replace phys physicians someday, right? Like, or, or is there still a role for physicians? And in some sense, I think you need both. My sense is that this, this approach, um, it might be able to narrow down a set of things that should be examined um, that should be examined in more detail. But for all the reasons that Luis raised and, and, um, and some, some, some others as well, it's gonna be imperfect. So it can't be the only tool in the arsenal. It's just one of, one of several tools. And what can you do in that case beyond keep, still keep grinding away? I mean, I, once again, I salute the word KEI has been doing. It's the NIH should, the NIH and other funders should be able to I mean, include, it's a, it, I just don't see why you can't compel 
the grantees and contractors. I don't see a reasonable argument. I, and I try to come up with you know the trade-offs to every argument as were in some of my previous slides that I went through. I don't see a reasonable argument for the NIH not proactively um, forcing grantees and contractors to, to keep this information. So, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Zane. Um, I think Catherine might be able to speak to this more, but in, in the database we constructed, for example, it is, it, is a, it is an aggregate number. And there are some instances where the contracts are, uh, they're like two separate agreements that they entered into, so you can't disaggregate. Like the Moderna example, there was a BARDA deal initially and that BARDA deal was expanded. And so BARDA has done about a billion dollars. And then there was an additional supply agreement that they entered into Operation Warp Speed, which includes the DOD. Um, and so I think in that instance, you can disaggregate. And um, I think maybe I should disaggregate in the database and I think about it. But in many of the other deals, um, like the AstraZeneca one, for example, it's, it's, it's sort of both. It's, it, it, they say we're helping them expand manufacturing facilities and also we're gonna you know, buy 100 million doses or 300 million doses when, when the time is right. Uh, Catherine. Um, yeah, so what Zane said is exactly correct. Many of the agreements are separate. So when the government is funding R&D from like the early stage preclinical research all the way through FDA approval, um, then it tends to have a separate purchase agreement. So a good example of that is Moderna. Um, but with AstraZeneca and Novavax, the government is funding some very uh, late stage research and scaling up of manufacture in the procurement agreement. So I just um, presented them as separate, like conceptually, to show the role of Advanced Technology International in the procurement agreements, but sometimes they do overlap. Um, the second question is the rationale for using ATI. And um, that's a really good question because it's concerning if there is no legitimate rationale, then is this just being used to evade oversight and weaken the government's rights um, in the IP and data? That's a really good question. And the answer that ATI gave to Sidney Lupkin, that NPR reporter, didn't reassure me at all. They said that a, um, ATI said that they were using the framework because the membership was already in place. But you can look at the, the federal register to see when people joined the consortium that ATI is facilitating. And Novavax, which is one of the companies that has these huge contracts, joined the summer. So it, it's not like Novavax is already a member and this is just speeding things along. It, it's kind of the other way around. So I don't know the rationale. Um, I think that's something that the government should be transparent about. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Louise. Yeah, th thank you, Professor uh, Sampat, for, for the question. So, so you asked, why do uh, patent holders uh, disclose government funding through certificate of correction? I really don't know why, but I'll give you three theories that, that I think um, are reasonable. Number one is it might just be because they 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 learned that they should have done this in um, you know after the, the patent was granted um, because the technology technology transfer office told them to um, they they do I don't think they do it on a on a case by case case basis but they do uh, organize this like seminars and trainings uh, you know periodically so maybe patent holders or or uh, people uh, that, uh, you know, technology transfer people, they learn that they should have this close government interest and then they do it. Um, one way we can, uh, I think, test this, this theory is that is by, by looking into the timing of the I Edison uh, disclosure and comparing that to the certificate of correction date. Um, obviously, the I Edison is secret, something that is, you know, is, uh, uh, we, we criticize that. I Edison should be completely public, um, uh, and, and therefore we cannot do that uh, empirical research. But we could, uh, as opposed, uh, look into the, this thing called the confirmatory licenses, which also tend to have. Um, uh, I think they are correlated with with the timing of the I Edison disclosure. So if we compare confirmatory license and certificate correction. Um, we might learn uh, a, a little bit more about that. The other theory, you know, the other thing is that there is cases where there is some pressure um, and, and those disclosures through certificate of correction, we think happen because of those, that uh, pressure. I'll mention one case, which because this 
this year, the Global Congress is being organized uh, by Colombian um, uh, friends. Um, I'm, I'll mention the Gleevec case, which is very important and quite frankly in, infuriating because for 18 years, uh, Novartis and others failed to disclose government interests and then they did it to a certificate of correction. And so KEI yeah. had been working on government funded around funding uh, around Gleevec for a while, but also we just learned last week that um, the House Oversight uh, Committee was actually uh, talking to, to Novartis about government funding of, of, around Gleevec and, and asked them specifically whether uh, there's government funding disclosed. And, and I analyzed the timing of the correspondence between the House Oversight Committee and Novartis, and it looks like they corrected the record because of things that KI published and, and questioned that the Oversight Committee was asking. So, so pressure is, is, it plays a role. And uh, Gleevec is one example, but there's other, uh, I'll, 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 uh, a shameless plug here. You can go to KEI's website and look for, uh, in the areas of work and look for a website that we have on failure to disclose and you will find several cases. In some occasions, there has been a correction following a, a letter sent by KEI. Uh, th thank you very much. We had a, a, a question from uh, from Ken uh, Shadlin. Uh, he asked about the the Moderna uh, MNR, mRNA uh, technology platform and the government rights in the in the vaccine. And he says, uh, what are the potential rights in other MNR vaccines? And uh, is it is it is this restricted? Is government's rights restricted Moderna more general? And I I I think. I will just offer a, my quick take on this, and that is that uh, 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 this is a new a new platform for vaccines, and I think, and whenever there's sort of some new area of platform, it, it, it's concerning about whatever patents are issued because they may be broad for the development of the technology. Uh, they may have application for other diseases, other vaccines within the same disease. Uh, it's not related uh, strictly to Moderna. Moderna gets a lot of attention. They've had uh, uh, a massive amount of federal funding and the, the president talks them up all the time. But uh, I think it's uh, it's a more general issue. Uh, we have uh, three minutes. I just want to give everyone a chance to say a, a concluding remark before we before we stop. I will say one thing. Uh, we're going to host a, uh, a discussion about transparency of, of uh, on, on October 13th at 3 p.m. Uh, Washington, D.C. time. And anyone who wants to, it's, it'll be an open discussion um, where some of these issues about clinical trial costs, contracts, licenses, and things like that uh, uh, will be discussed. It'll be an informal uh, discussion, un unlike uh, this presentation, which was more structured. Um, but uh, for us to wind up the session and to keep the, mod keep the, uh, the control master happy on this event, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, go through and uh, starting with Louise, I'd like people to give a very short uh, 30 second concluding remarks um, uh, about the session and then we're gonna have to close it down. Thank you, uh, Louise. Yeah, just, first, just to thank you all the panelists. Uh, I've learned a lot here. And second, um, so on the failure to disclose, I think the NIH budget is $35 billion. Um, that's approximately $35 billion more than like my salary. If, if we can do this, this you know, investigation um, ourselves and find this failure to disclose, the NIH could do that too. Um, BARDA can do it and DARPA can do it, and, and so they should. Uh, Catherine? Um, my concluding point is that given the lack of certainty over what's in these agreements because they use the other transactions authority, it is um, especially important to have transparency of the agreements and the agreements that we obtained under the FOIA um, did reveal concerning information about IP and data, but they were heavily redacted and we appealed the redactions and are pursuing the information in other FOIAs. Um, so we are pursuing, continuing to pursue transparency as best we can and stay tuned because um, this story is not over and there's more to learn about what's going on. Thank you, uh, Zane. Um, I, I would just say we focused a lot on Moderna, but there are, you know, for many different companies, just because of the space we're in infectious diseases, there's overwhelmingly, you know, in, in, in immense government support at every stage. Um, and many of the platforms, so for example, the J&J &J platform, 
it was originally used for Ebola and they got their Ebola vaccine license. But that process, you know, was underpinned by a lot of NIH money at the early stages. Dan Baruch, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, at Harvard led some of the work and he's an NIH funded scientist. Um, same with the Merck vaccine. The Merck vaccine, they're developing two, but one of them is literally using the same platform that they had used for their Ebola vaccine, which is developed by Canadian scientists in Winnipeg. And so uh, a lot of these platform technologies have benefited from um, um, government investments at many stages, even before the new coronavirus. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Sampat, last yeah, word. To, to my fellow, to my co-panelists, and, and to you, Jamie, too, keep up the good work. It's useful not only in the real world, but also for academics like myself trying to get a handle on these issues. Thank you. I, I think the control master wants me to uh, terminate the session, so I'm going to hit the leave button. I'm not sure if I actually have the kill switch or not, but uh, thanks everyone for doing this, and we'll uh, make sure that there's, a, I think there'll be a, a, a version of this on YouTube. Thank you.